Oh, honey, come and dance with me. I want to keep you company. You know you suit me to a T. Honey, come and dance with me. Oh, honey, got my two-tone shoes to stepping out to the blues. With you, I know I just can't lose. Honey, come and dance with me. Been working hard all day. Saturday night, I like to play. Do you wanna get away and find us a roadhouse band? Oh, wanna be grand, honey, dance with me. You know I love you, can't you see? Do you wanna spend your life with me? Honey, won't you take a chance on a real romance? Oh, honey, honey, won't you come and dance? Been working hard all day. Saturday night, I like to play. Oh, baby, make a getaway and find us a roadhouse band. Oh, wanna be grand? Oh, dance with me. You know I love you, can't you see? Oh, won't you spend your life with me? Honey, won't you take a chance on a real romance? Oh, honey, honey, won't you come and dance? The fabulous Elise Santora and Desmar Guevara on piano. Welcome, everybody, to Pregones Theater. Welcome to Let's Talk. My name is Arnaldo Lopez, and I'm happy to be your host for tonight. Uh, I want to tell you a little bit about uh, Let's Talk. It's really the iteration, the latest iteration of a long-time tradition of conversation and performance on the stage of Pregones Theater, now Pregones Theater and the Puerto Rican Traveling Theater, giving it a new spin, a new life. And this is the first of many of these conversations that we're having here in the Bronx and also in Manhattan. Um, the format for tonight is uh, artists, uh, friends, scholars who uh, have supported our work and to whom we like to give an insider's perspective of what it's like to create theater. And of course, a live audience. A live audience, you who are with us here tonight in the Bronx, but also for the first time, a live streaming audience through our partners uh, in HowlRound. So we welcome you to the Bronx and we welcome you around the nation. Um, the Appalachian Puerto Rican musical Betsy, that's what we're here to talk about, um, is really the outcome of many years of collaboration between uh, two companies that have 21 years uh, doing, doing things together. Uh, we've had uh, previous uh, staged performances, uh, we've had travels, we've had productions showcasing the culture of Puerto Rico and the culture of the Appalachians. Um, I believe that we're going to be cued for the first intervention, and, uh, and I'm, I'm really pleased to welcome someone I admire immensely. Uh, she's a folklorist, an anthropologist, and a culture maker. She's associate research professor at the University of Arizona, trustee of the American Folklife Center at the Library of Congress, and executive director of the Southwest Folklife Alliance, uh, which is an Art Plays America finalist for this year, 2015. She has visited and uh, dialogued with the artists of both of our theaters during the last year and a half or so, uh, during the development of, of the new uh, staging of Betsy that will premiere in April in our theater in 47th Street, Manhattan. And she will frame for us the nature and the contours of this intercultural musical and what, what that may mean. So joining us uh, from Tucson is Dr. Maribel Alvarez. Welcome, Maribel. I'm going to... We're holding out for the cue on the sound. We're hoping for the... Can audience. you hear me? Now we can hear you. Thank yes. you. Yes? Yes. 
Welcome I was saying what an honor it is. Thank you. I was saying what an honor it is for me to be part of this collaboration. I, I love the work of both of these companies and it's been a real joy to be a witness to the uh, behind the scenes, scenes of love making between the two companies, if you will. So a little bit of a, a sense that I bring to this experience. But my job is to do a little bit of intellectual framework around what this work um, represents. I've been asked to read some small portions of the essay that I've been writing. It's a draft, so uh, we still welcome sort of your feedback. Um, all families have secrets, but not all secrets carry the same weight of significance. Some things that people prefer to keep under wraps are nothing more than harmless anecdotes left untold to save the guilty from embarrassment. But there are other secrets that possess the gravitas of life-altering scenarios. A facsimile of a birth record accidentally discovered in a box in the basement, or honestly, by a visiting relative, or that photograph that hung on the back of the closet for decades. In the musical Betsy, secrets attach themselves like flies to scraps of memory. In some instances, they are revealed in plain sight, but most of the time they are only hinted at, acting like some kind of hunting that one wishes to escape and teasing and acting in this way on the audience itself. In the opening act, we are introduced to Betsy, just as she is about to come on stage to sing at a club in the Bronx panorama, she is described by the announcer as incomparable. There she is, bilingual, biracial, urban, an accomplished Latin jazz singer on the verge of fame, a spotlight of self-assurance shining bright on her, and she comes to sing a Caribbean guaracha. But soon we learn that the past refuses to wash away and de una manera insolente, insolently, insists on disrupting Betsy's life. Historical trauma has this mischievous way about it. Precisely when song and triumph ought to command all the attention, ghostly reminders of unfinished family business contaminate the scene. The audience is clued very early on in the play to an elusive truth that you will try to pursue throughout the rest of the play, sometimes successfully, sometimes less so. Something happened to this child. Way back in the recesses of her ancestry, before her conscious mind was able to understand how the wishes of the dead travel in time. And here we find that the admixture that makes Betsy beautiful and at the same time exotic is also a toxic cocktail of sexual violence, of a history of loss against miscegenation, the mixing of the races, harking from yesteryear when love was trumped by shame. In Betsy's Scots-Irish Puerto Rican lineage, the safe house of kinship gets hit by a historical tornado. Among the events that come to disrupt her life, we are reminded of the large role that indentured servitude and indeed white slavery play in the nation's development. We are asked as audience members to confront a shameful past that we barely know. So we begin to learn Betsy's stories through these darkened alleys of recollection that will surprise Betsy herself. Her urban world all of a sudden turned blue from vestiges of a rural past. Her Spanish-English code switching tongues twisted by a sudden drawl. Her Puerto Rican identity stretched northward across the Atlantic, bathed in shades of emerald green from that Irish nation. And at the place most vulnerable moments, an additional meaningful resonance that rises like smoke from the city's underground pipelines. And we then come to the realization, all of a sudden, 
that Betsy's story is our story. It's American pluralism. It's also a kind of gargantuan family secret in its own right. And from there, I have tried to frame the beginning of the play as a, as a revelation because a lot of facts within the story of Betsy are historical bits and pieces that are not very common, very well known. And I also try to then move from that in the direction of asking to what degree American theater has been able to grapple with this phenomenon of interculturalism, which I'm very interested in defining as a separate and distinct from a response to multiculturalism. I think that there's uh, been an impulse in the last 25, 30 years of the big white theater companies responding to the plight of minority uh, or minority sized art forms. And that has been the model of the multicultural presenting a theater uh, scene. In Betsy, we see this taken to a different dimension where two stories of two of two often marginalized identities um, two minority size positions come together to weave even a more complicated cloth of that American identity than a simple, um, powerful and weak uh, story would narrate. And in that sense, um, it is complicated because the, it's not anymore a story about a simple line of uh, inclusion or outreach. It's not anymore a story about a simple um, realization of one's uh, blind spot about race is uh, is the story about the intermixing of marginalities and positionalities in a way that uh, causes a, a, a deeper resonance of the spirit and of the spiritual truth that are uh, fly, uh, being worked uh, through the characters. Um, like I said, I, I think that uh, that's been a, a really interesting experience for me as a writer, as an anthropologist to observe. And I believe that what we will see in the play is this intermingling of the personal story of Betsy and her own family ghost um, uh, accentuated in and in, in, in having an echo into the larger story. As a matter of fact, in some of the previous um, showing of Betsy, uh, the, the public has already reacted to this truth. Um, not only have the Bronx and Appalachia have been iconic sites mythologized and folklorized forever, uh, but the public that has been coming in previous productions has seen uh, this resonance in their own lives. There is a particular story um, about one man in the Bronx uh, so deeply affected by the play that he walked out in midway and explained to one of the Pregones members out in the lobby that his own story paralleled Betsy in ways that he had never been able to confront. Um, and yet we know that impact and steering emotions in this way, um, the, the, the kind of message that we are used to, to hear about uh, outreach to vulnerable populations is not all of the story uh, for companies like Roadside and Prebonis. There's a desire to extend meaning making uh, in a different kind of metric of impact that reflects also on the ability to make art out of these scraps of memory, out of these sort of fragmented stories and neighborhoods and mythologized and stereotype areas. Uh, with the specificity of colors and music, banjos and cuatros, um, musics and movements and rhythms, uh, baladas and guarachas, that, uh, that challenges an aesthetic uh, that has we have been so unfamiliar with and that um, represents in so many ways um, our present reality and our future as we continue to move in the 21st century. Um, those are some of my thoughts at the moment. Thank you so much, Maribel. We really appreciate it. Um, I hope that you will stick around for the live stream. We really, uh, this really helps us put into context. And uh, we, will, we will continue to dialogue with you. Thank you much. So, Thank you, everyone. 
history, trauma, memory, um, ghosts in the closet, but also possibly the opening into an intercultural moment that is new uh, to a different kind of mixing and to a creativity that really is navigating different kinds of connections. So a lot to think about and um, we're gonna now ask Dudley Koch and uh, Rosalba Rolon to join us. Dudley Koch is uh, the director of uh, Roadside Theater and uh, Rosalba Rolon is the artistic director of Pregones Theater and uh, they're collaborating as uh, directors and uh, dramaturg writers for this uh, production. So I'm anxious to hear a little bit about the idea of collaboration, both in terms of the collaboration that the two of you have led for both of these theaters, um, and maybe a little bit in, in the terms that, that Maribel is suggesting, that this intercultural moment is, is different and that Betsy is an example of that. Well, it seems, uh, was it 93 or 94 when we got started? One or the other. One or the other, I think. And um, it was kind of a brilliant move, I thought, on uh, Pregonis' part, because uh, we'd been introduced, but we had never been to the Bronx. We're from the mountains of central Appalachia, and that's eastern Kentucky, southern West Virginia. Uh, Southwest Virginia and Upper East Tennessee. So it's a pretty isolated place. There's no public transportation. The closest airport's a couple hours away, no bus service. So here we were going to come uh, to the Bronx. Now we had been performing around the, uh, around the country, so it wasn't like we'd never been away from home, but <laughs> we had never been to the Bronx. Now, one reason we got interested in the Bronx, back there in the 80s, uh, they used, the government would put out the poverty statistics, right? And Central Appalachia, our home, was always at the bottom unless the Bronx beat us. <laughs> and so we were flipping back and forth, who's the poorest neighborhood? And it occurred to us that the people in the Bronx must be our cousins. So we said we will go to the Bronx and, and the brilliance that Ragonas did. We had no idea, nobody knew us, but they made the, uh, the event mountain to mountain. They didn't say Appalachian mountain to mountain, they just said mountain to mountain exchange. So the mountains come to the Bronx, that was the advertisement. So who knew what mountain that might be? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, well, this is really a love affair that has taken, you know, 21 uh, years. And I feel that we're on an ongoing honeymoon between the two companies because it's a constant exploration of each other uh, in, in, so many, in so many amazing creative ways. And when we uh, wanted to, way back, you know, bring uh, Rosite here and then they brought us to, to Weisberg, uh, Kentucky, to perform one of our plays, um, I thought, you know, how do I tell our community, our neighbors, that these people are coming from Whitesburg, Kentucky? And I thought, well, they may not know about Whitesburg, Kentucky, but our neighborhood know about, knows about mountains. And sure enough, there was a huge response. I think that one of my favorites, which became sort of a, an anthem for both companies, is with one of our uh, audience members came out from the first performances they saw of Roadside, he saw, and he said to me, you know, Rosalba, I didn't understand any, anything, but I understood everything. And, and, and the reason about that understanding is, you know, uh, that we all have our accents, have you noticed? And so we would be in a room looking at each other's mouths to make sure that we were understanding each other correctly. And I saw them for the first time and I thought that they were vegetarians. So we didn't know what to think. Uh, and, and they thought, you know, that we were going to the mountains and they're saying, well, there are no Puerto Ricans in the, uh, uh, around here. And then we go there and then a, a bus load of uh, Puerto Ricans from Tennessee drove like, what, five, six hours to go and see the work. And we knew that we were on to something special. And that's why we have kept exploring. So this is our third piece together. We did a, um, uh, our first big piece in collaboration with Jumbo Productions, uh, Jumbo Theater in New Orleans, African-American troupe. 
and we worked uh, for six years on that project and toured uh, 17 states, I believe, at the time together. Uh, we also did put together a children's uh, show and with uh, Ron's stories. They're going to be run in a moment. And then uh, Roverside had already begun to work on Betsy, and we'll talk about you know, the Betsy life uh, in, in a moment. But I, I want to say that there is a key member of this uh, collaboration along with Desmar and Dudley and myself, uh, who is home in, uh, right now at Norton, uh, in uh, the roadside office, and we would love to introduce you to our dear, dear friend, Ron Short. Just a few words about Ron. Uh, Ron, like Rosalba says, is a core member of Roadside Theater for the past 35 years. He grew up in a family of singers, as an, an award-winning master uh, of old-time music, a gifted composer and performer, a playwright and co-writer and co-composer for this production, Betsy. Take it away, Ron. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here. Yes, I am in the mountains and we're covered with snow now. If I look out the window, I can see uh, that one of the highest peaks in Virginia, all covered with snow. And um, so for those of you uh, who uh, love snow and mountains, this would be a perfect scene. I, um, I set out to write Betsy um, because I knew in some ways that um, um, maybe this would be the last play that I would write. And, and uh, there were still so many stories to be told. And, um, but yet, uh, somehow in, in all my long career, I never managed to get farther away than my family. Uh, I, I couldn't get to the big stories until I told uh, the family stories. And then I began to realize, um, I began to understand uh, as we went along that um, uh, the story of my family uh, is the story of America. The story of your family is the story of America. These stories just haven't been told. There are other stories that have been told. We know them well, but these stories haven't been told. I um, understand how important environment is in the shaping of, um, of personality, of um, culture, identity. Um, our environment shapes who we are. I believe this strongly. Um, and America has this dual identity, uh, well, more than one, but, but there is this identity that has been, when people think of America, they think of the, of the cities. Uh, they think of New York City. They think of Chicago and, and um, L.A. But, but, you know, there is an older story, a much older story, Living in a rural environment, looking out at these mountains, seeing these mountains every day, you get a sense that the world that we live in is more important in some ways than those things that we build for ourselves. The world of the mountains around us. Here in the mountains, we have gotten used to solitude. And it's been that way from the beginning. One of the more interesting aspects of my people's story and the story of America is how many pioneers stepped out across boundaries that had never been stepped across before. To the plains and the prairies and to the hills. This is a story of one of my ancestors who stepped out on his own to help shape America. This is Betsy's great, 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 
great uncle. Three days the wind's been howling. Oh, and last night the wolves yawned in. There is frost in the air and all the mist here, and I am alone again. Today I saw a red-tailed hawk. He was shining on the wind. When he was Lord of all he surveyed, sometimes I feel like him. Oh, sometimes I feel like I own these mountains. Sometimes I own the wind. I am the rain. I am the sun. I am alone again. I tread through the gap at her moon to the Ohio country. Oh, but now there is people everywhere. There's no room left for me. Somewhere deep in my memories, in Ireland's green fields, I roam free. It was a different place, I had a different face, but it was still the same old me. Sometimes I feel like I own these mountains, sometimes I own the wind. I own the rain, I own the sun. I am alone again. Oh, sometimes I think the Lord never meant all this for me. And then sometimes I think, well, maybe he meant everyone should be this free. Free. I dream of a woman with long black hair. She helped me become a man. Her and the baby died last year. I am alone again. Now, I don't think I'm what you can call a Christian. But I pray every now and then. Because I have seen the face of all that is holy. A red tail hawk on the wind. Sometimes I feel like I own these mountains. Sometimes I own the wind. I own the rain. I own the sun. I am alone again. Ron Short, coming to us from Roadside. Thank you, Ron. You're welcome. So, Rosalba, we have a, a good sense from this beautiful performance of one of the hearts driving the story, and uh, we'd love to hear uh, the other ingredients. Sure. You can imagine, I mean, working with Ron is, is one of the privileges of my career, really one of the highlights of our collective career is working with this man. I get emotional. <laughs> so Betsy, um, 
when Dudley said, you know, uh, the original iteration of Betsy actually was, uh, as the story, as Ron was saying, he was, he was just telling the story of his family, of the many uh, Elizabeth and Betsy's in his family. And also there's another component to this, which is that jazz legend, Beji uh, uh, Adair, and, and BG, I'm sorry, uh, BG Adair, and, and BG, uh, a, a, a musician, an amazing musician, jazz player uh, from, from Tennessee, also participated in the creation of some of these characters and 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 the, maybe later in our Q&A you can talk a little bit about Biggie's role uh, in the original you know as as as, as Betsy took off so uh, I think that Rosa felt that Betsy's story was complete and then we began to talk about it and then we said wow we have gone this far in our marriage right we have to have a baby together and so I decided that we were going to have a baby, and that baby is Betsy. In other words, that story that they were ha had been telling, the story of Betsy, needed to go even further. And through the generosity of everyone involved, we decided uh, that this Betsy is going to be the child of Elizabeth. And Elizabeth fell in love with Pedro Garcia, Betsy's father. Elizabeth is called Irish from Appalachia, and she came to New York City to study music, and she falls in love with Pedro, and they have this baby, Betsy. Elizabeth died when Betsy was a child, and Betsy grew up as a Bronx, Puerto Rican, Latin jazz singer. So the Irish in her was dormant for many years. Until something happens, I won't tell you what it is because you have to go see the play. Something happened that makes the spirit of all of the Betsy's come back to stage, come back alive and confront our Bronx Betsy with that part of her that has been uh, dormant for so many years. And so what our challenge now was is how do we construct, how do we build the uh, other side of the story without having to, you know, going into the, the deep historical moments of Puerto Rican history because it was not about that. It's about who Betsy is. It's about the way she walks. It's about the music she makes. It's about, it's her persona. It's the music she likes. The music she would like to love and something is holding her back. And that is the Betsy we bring to the story. You know, the result of all of these combinations. Let me ask you, Rosal, about that development. Is that something that uh, comes from an idea that you had? Did, did, did that develop itself and how long a time? Well, we've been, actually, we did a first, a first round in 2006. And at 2006, Elisa Santora, who played, uh, you just heard her sing, and she's coming back in a moment, uh, played uh, the spirits. And she continued to play all those spirits. She's possessed. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then we did it on 2008 again. And we haven't done it since. We have been working on some of the development of more music, instrumentation, which we're going to talk about in a minute. And we're going to listen to some great music, hear some great music. So, but it is about, it's about processing from moment to moment. We don't do it in a hurry. It cannot be done in a hurry. And, and we got to a point, you, you have to find that moment where you say, I have to get it out of my system. And we said, you know what? We have to get this Betsy on, on, on her feet again. And this time with, um, with a new rush of energy, in, if you will, in terms of developing the Puerto Rican sort of persona of this Betsy, of the story. And this, that's what we have been working on. Uh, we're still working on the second act, and, but, but very advanced and, and tight first act. And that is, that is just the process. So, um, and, and very grateful because we have the, uh, so many artists involved and, 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 and some continue to be. I mentioned um, Elise Santora, who we just, you know, a star in her own right. Um, who has been really a, a, a pivotal part of, of a member of this ensemble. We also have other actresses involved, uh, like Meredith Byrne, Yarisa Pizarro. It's like, like alumni of Betsy's, mm -hmm. you know, and spirits at this point. But we also have had Desmar Guevara from the very beginning, our musical director and composer. And I think uh, we owe our musicians and our composer a huge debt of gratitude because it is a part of their own connection with amongst themselves that help us develop you know the script and the energy that we need to bring to the to the play
Fantastic. Thank you so much, Rosalba. This is, uh, uh, those last comments are meaningful to me because I have a sense that this kind of work, as much as this particular play, uh, is really a, a process that evolves over time. So there's this sense that each time that we've seen a version of Betsy on stage, it's brought something new. Yes. Uh, and the idea that you're bringing it to the culmination is really very exciting. I'm, I'm going to walk over to the piano so I can chat with Desmar. I, um, in as much as the entire production evolves over time, there's also a great sense that music is a big part of this show and, uh, and that there's something particular about creating in a way that is authentic to two very rich and distinct musical cultures. And uh, this might, I'm hoping that you can tell us uh, a little bit about what it's like to, to do that, what it's like to create a play where you have several collaborators bringing very distinct uh, flavors of music, uh, bringing distinct instruments, and uh, tell us a little bit about that. Uh, yes, uh, when I know uh, many, many times we hear that music is a universal language, and, and that's true, that's the truth. Uh, you, you, can, you can relate to other cultures through, through music, but in this process, when the first time that we that I started collaborating with, with uh, Roadside, we were working also with uh, with another theater group from New Orleans called uh, Junebug, and we were that was back in 1998, 1997. We were doing another play, and in the first week of collaborations, we all the musicians from from Roadside, from Junebug, and from Pregones, we met in a room. I start to create music and playing. And for two days, nothing happened. And we, we, we weren't communicating because everybody were, you know, defending their own music. Until we stopped one day and started to listen to each other's history and stories from, of how we became musicians, how this music came to to our, to ourselves and after we did that we started playing and literally magic happened music started happening and and that's that's my experience with with this with 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 the month with the with the Appalachian uh, company also the music the new music that I'm trying to bring in this in this next next that we do it for the first time in the play, I'm adding a Puerto Rican cuatro that will be the counterpart of the banjo. And just recently, that idea came because Rosalba told me, why, won't, why don't we do this? And that was my, that created my, inspired me to, to call these two musicians and put them to collaborate together. Yesterday, they met for the first time and we play here and it's beautiful, it's beautiful also the history of the instruments is very similar because come from struggle, come from, from oppressed people, and the, that music is from the mountains and, and it divides. Um, for example, the, Puerto Rico, the, the Hibaro music from Puerto Rico, it comes from, from the melodies varies from towns and towns. And I just learned yesterday that the banjo tuning is a different tuning from town to town. So there is, a, there is a similarity. We just need to listen to each other first and, and then come together. So I would like for you to have a little taste of what I had yesterday. If it's possible, we would like to bring Antonio Guzman and Silvia and to play a little bit of what you're gonna hear in March, in April.
Sylvia Ryerson on banjo and Antonio Guzman on cuatro. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Let me tell you a little bit more about them. Sylvia has worked at Apple Shop for the last five years, producing public affairs programs for community radio, and she co-directs Apple Shop's traditional music project. Antonio Guzman was born and raised in Puerto Rico, and he's a freelance guitarist in the New York City area, and we are happy to have them in this, in this particular production. Thank you both. And now we're going to turn the conversation to casting, because uh, casting is so much of what gives a production its personality. Um, and I'll start off by saying that both of these companies respect music in its own right as a character. So there's the music that uh, fills the room and gives it uh, more than ambiance, brings the heart and speaks and connects directly to story. But I'd like to call Elise Santora back to the stage to uh, see if we can talk a little bit about her experience. Welcome, Elise. We'd like to know more. You, you've had the, the fortune of, of being in, in this play, knowing this uh, evolving production yes. uh, uh, in, in a, through a number of years. Uh, you were spirit. Yes. Uh, I think at one point you played seven. Seven ladies. Seven yes. ladies. And that was before act two. <laughs> um, and now it's three. Yes. <laughs> so, well. so tell us more about those three characters. Um, you know, the, the exciting thing about this is really that I, I get to, to sort of be these people that came before her and sort of unveil the history of who she is in real time. Um, so I'm sort of the, per I, I get to be the character that puts the pieces together of something she didn't even know she was missing. Um, and, and these women are the women that encounter what Maribel and Ron spoke about, which is these women went through a history of being indentured servants, um, having to sell themselves, never owning property, uh, to actually eventually owning property and raising their children in harsh uh, mountainous regions, uh, fighting poverty, fighting being a woman at that time, and fighting for their children, ultimately. And the interesting thing that I want to highlight about doing this spirit is that spirit turns into all the Elizabeth and Betsy's that, come, that came before, her actual ancestors. And when I was doing the rehearsals, um, I, there, there was, you, you've heard some of the music. It's just beautiful. It just, it comes, it's sort of, a, it feels like a heart pulse. And so what happens is that during rehearsal, I'd be in tears, trying to sing a song. Uh, all the songs that I sang just seemed to hit me so deeply. And so my question during rehearsal to Rosaba was, why am I, because I'm Puerto Rican and Cuban, and I got nothing, I like the Irish people fine, but I don't really understand why I'm so connected without even having to do that much work as an actor. And come to realize in the conversation with Ron and Rosalba and Dudley, we came to the conclusion that it's because we were all colonized. We were subjected to oppression by colonialism. We know, we Puerto Ricans know the, the oppression of that. We know not owning. We know the idea of being estranged. We know the idea of being an immigrant. It was all, and we're connected to the land a lot of these women are so connected to the land. And that was what was, I was hearing and feeling in the music. And so that I, my work was made very easy by the music, which is another character. And there, there's the genealogy leading up to Betsy. And uh, yes. what do we know about the new, the new Betsy? Yeah, so I, you know, we get all the way to the mother of Betsy, but you know, we really kind of need to know who Betsy actually is going to be. Yes. We will know. Right now, we're going to make the big cast announcement. First of all, let me tell you for a moment about Elise. Yikes. Elise is a huge star, a member of our ensemble for many years, a staple of the Broadway scene, uh, an incredible amazing artists uh, at all levels and I th we kept thinking okay so in this new life of Betsy 
um, we need a match. <laughs> and so, you know, we would love to announce tonight our new Betsy, our own Bronx bred spoken word, hip hop artist, singer, dancer, star, Caridad de la Luz, La Bruja. And here she is. <laughs> trying to do Betsy this Elizabeth that I'm a Garcia I'm not a swindle <laughs> none of this is me <laughs> and, and you and him and them are not my people as you know so let's just end this madness okay bye okay 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 just for the sake of argument, what happened to Swindle? After all, according to you, he was my great, great, great grandfather. He disappeared into the wilderness before Betsy's baby brother Wesley was born. So Wesley never knew his father? No, he didn't. And Elizabeth rarely spoke of him. When she did, she did so with bitter tears and warnings regarding the reckless and foolish nature of all men. I came to this country an orphan, a refugee from Ireland's green shores. A woman alone has only two choices to be a wife or a whore. I decided that no man would own me for more than an hour at a time. I know that many will condemn me, but I claim my life as mine. My children will never go hungry. I saved my gold and I planned. Together we will leave the city and go to the Cumberland land. All oh, the Cumberland land holds me close like a lover's hand. And now I lay me down to rest in the arms of the Cumberland land. Now, JC. He is my eldest. He's ashamed of me, it is so. But the others still call me mama, and I hope they will never know. Last night I dreamed of the green hills of Ireland, and I walk with a fever in my head. JC prayed for me most of the day, but I will never rise from this bed. All the Cumberland land holds me close like a lover's hand, and now lay me down to rest in the arms of the Cumberland land. And now in the arms of the Cumberland Land. Well, did you stay long on the tavern trade? I, I mean, you know, as a barmaid? When my boy Eli was born, Eli, he was your great-great-grandfather. Was he 
Eli's father-in-law? No. His father was Eli Phipps. He stayed around just long enough for me to bear another boy. Shortly after that boy's birth, he sold me a parcel of land for the sum of $18. Mm-hmm. Nine acres on the waters of Elk Creek. Yes, indeed. Tossed and battered on life's stormy seas. Lies and dreams both believe looking It's easily seen what we should have done, who we might have been. Today I start my life over. tell myself and no one but me will pay the price for how I've lived but when I look in the eyes of my children I see my whole life staring back Yes, sir. That third, my Betsy girl. Ladies and gentlemen, our name is James Jimmy Jim Swindell Wolf. Live on cable, whooping anything from the engine down to the rattlesnake. Well, sure, I can whoop the toenails off from the grizzly bear. I never was. Who wants fixing to tell you about that? When old Deacon Smith for a meeting, I got there. I was hot enough to melt. Pure. Oh, thought of a pond in Deacon's bed. Went well spent till I got there. Pulled off his old red flannel hunting shirt of mine. Was in the pond of bed. Looked out on the bank. See the devil. Pure T devil standing right there. He made a grab at me and I stepped back and said, Hey, I ain't no man for standing in another man's way. Well, he made another dive at me. I grabbed him by the tail, give him six and a half dozen circles around that large meadow, come to a big old white old stump, wrapped his tail around that stump, said, Now you stand there, you pull that stump out by its roots, or your tail won't other. <laughs> I can soon see he's going to stand. Then I looked and I seen Brandon and six or half a dozen of them old hounds from hell come across that there big old mirror. I know they's all going to pile in on me and kill me or devil is not doing it. So I told that devil, I'm going to take the extra pass on that back end of yours and unloosen you. I unloosen him. He grabbed me by the seat of pants, coat collar, pitched me over north side, south of the mountain, into a beech, white oak, black gum, cherry tree. Huh, guess what was I when I got there? <laughs> Hornet's nest. Peck of stinging worms and more. Some of them stung me. Some of them stung Brenner. Some of them stung him old hounds. <laughs> Went on down the road. 
met that pretty little red-dressed Betsy gal of mine. <laughs> yeah. Ain't he an awful sight? <laughs> I am. <laughs> Thank you, Ron. Thank you so much for being with us. We appreciate and Thank you. get a good sense. So lovely to see everybody. Thank you so much. And to see Elise and all of you again and to meet this wonderful, talented young woman. Thank you. Thank you. And we're going to open it to the audience. And uh, I welcome everybody who was up here before to join us again. And uh, see if we can get some additional talk going. Questions from you? Comments from you? Comments or doubts? <laughs> <laughs> you know you want to ask something. Go ahead. <laughs> Christina, come on. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> uh, we, could, we could get started, maybe. Uh, I'd like to ask Caridad if yes. she would like to give us. I mean, I know that. Um, You've had you, you've become familiar with this only recently, and uh, it's a world of discovery. I remember when other performers have come into it, and I'd like to see how it feels so far. Um, it's I feel like not only in the play is Betsy visited by by spirits and of there being a message. I feel like there's a message for me personally um, that it, it came at the very right time for me. Um, so I really believe that this is, you know, kismet and and meant to be. And I'm so honored to have been chosen. And I mean, I could get emotional too. And I haven't even learned the whole play yet. <laughs> but just what I know that it means to all of these people and the trajectory to know that it's based in a story, you know, that that's real, and that it comes from the mountains, and to be connected to both the mountains in Puerto Rico to the mountains in Appalachia or Appalachia, or I'm still <laughs> learning how to say this right. Um, you know, it, it just means so much to me to be able to join these worlds and to be chosen to represent, you know, this character is, is just beyond amazing. And I am so, so grateful. And I hope to do it justice for those generations that are alive and those ancestors that are watching because I, I feel the spirit of it and, um, and it's a blessing. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, I, I have a related question for Dudley and Rosalba which has to do with when you cast somebody, when you've had, uh, when you work with somebody like Elise for some time and I'm curious how much does that feed back into the development of this evolving script and in the case of bringing in Caridad only recently and had a chance to, to have some work sessions, what that's like? Very much so, and actually, uh, this time that we have been working on, uh, reworking the first act, actually, we invited Elise into the conversation because we knew not only what the challenges were for us, but also for her uh, as an interpreter of this character. You know, what, what was does her memory tell her from her first participation in it? So it's been a great conversation to have one of the performers in the room as we de developed. And then, of course, Ron, who uh, has been a performing uh, uh, performer on the piece as well, a creator of the character of the man uh, that is yet to be cast. <laughs> um, then Ron also partic has participated in, in contributing some notes and things that we need to know. So I think that, the, that this message that you're all going to see in April April, remember April, uh, from the 8th through the 26th at the Puerto Rican Traveling Theater. That Betsy is going to have a great mix of ingredients, not only from Dolly and myself, but from the performance as well, which is, which is amazing. And I'm really looking forward to working with Caridad because, as I said, we have said Betsy is this Latin jazz singer, but I have the feeling that this Betsy is also pulled by hip hop and pulled by spoken word. And we want to see where that Betsy is going to take us next. So this is great. And 
the gift of these two musicians. I can't imagine what has begun to, he has us fantasizing about what, how, where this is gonna go. That's, that's my take on it. Yeah, um, you know, like we said earlier, uh, this began as a, a one person show, Ron telling and performing his family history. And then we took that show down to Nashville to work with some Nashville jazz musicians. And one of those musicians was B.G. Adair, a wonderful uh, pianist, a Steinway artist and so forth, many, many albums. And she said, you know, this is some of my story too. I'm from Horse Cave, Kentucky. And this is, and we'd known her. And she said, I, I wanna get my story in. So we got B.G.'s story in and she composed for it. And then we said, well, we gotta take this up to our friends in the Bronx and they'll tell us uh, how we're doing. And we came up here and performed it in the little White House over here, packed, you couldn't get in. Um, and they said, we like it. And some of our story is there. So this is just growing. And with Caridad, it'll grow another, um, another, another layer. And that's, that's how we make art. Over a long arc of time, we've been collaborating for 21 years. There's really no hurry as long as it <laughs> keeps getting better. <laughs> and also, of course, the layers of the music because we're, we're on our way to, to the mountains in another two weeks to work some more, work with Ron for the Smart and Ron to work together and work on some more composition. And then all in a room together. This is not just director, actor, you know, like I tell you what to do and you move. It's about us doing it together uh, with a degree of integrity and love for the piece. So, you know, that, that's a little bit more. I, I really would love for, for all of you to come see, uh, come see it. And please don't be shy if you have any questions or comments or anything. I will, we'll talk some more after this, but, but we certainly would love to get your, impu I I um, your I input or, or any, anything that you think uh, might be missing or if you want to share a story, that's, that's great too. Any hands? Please. <laughs> Short answer, yes. Yes, I think this is the time finally has come to, to do a, a great recording of this piece. Yes. <laughs> and the company has produced some of its prior productions uh, as uh, audio recording. Uh, so Desmar is sort of the, uh, not only the musical director and composer for Pregones Theater, PRTT, but uh, also head of the production department for that. Yeah, I could say too, just a, a little bit about Apple Shop from Appalachian Workshop. Rudside Theater is one part of Apple Shop. An apple shop began in 1969 during the war on poverty and the idea was to train young people in film so they could get jobs. These are uh, young people in poor communities so that they could get a head start on some jobs. So from that little beginning in 1969, just a job training program, it has grown into this Appalachian voice. So we have our own record company, our own radio station. We make a lot of documentary films. We have an archive, we publish, we have photography, and of course, the theater. But it began as just a little idea, uh, a head start economic opportunity. And in some ways, the reason it succeeded when the others around the country failed is because Washington couldn't get down into the mountains to mess with the program. So they couldn't enforce their little curriculum on these young people. And so the young people just took the cameras and made film. Everybody, where else in the country, they were over there scolding them and making them go through the curriculum. So they never got anything made. When the government pulled out their money, there was nothing to show, except here in Appalachia and then it took off from there. I'm really excited because I feel like, you know, we are going to be able to move mountains and, uh, and show people that, you know, may think that these two cultures are so different to show them just how alike and how, you know, how, how human we all are. So I believe that this is going to be monumental in, in helping bring people together on, on just, 
on a, on a whole universal scale because we're considered so different. We all look at each other, at, you know, s like far apart, but we're all connected. And I know that this play is going to really bring so many worlds together. And that's what's so exciting to me. Thank you so much. I, in addition to tonight, uh, we are rolling out uh, some interesting conversations online. Betsy, the musical, is on social media. Please uh, seek us out on Facebook um, and keep uh, track of what we're doing and contribute your opinions, uh, your stories, your comments, uh, and your questions, which we will be happy to answer online, too. I want to bring somebody who's been pivotal to, to a lot of what we're doing in support, including uh, this particular conversation, Jamie Haft, if you can join me. Jamie has been working with Roadside Theater now for eight years, and she's Associate Director of Imagining America, which uh, she will tell us more about. Welcome, Thanks, Jane. Arnaldo. My feeling here in this room is that there's something special here that needs to be shared. And Imagining America is a consortium of more than 100 colleges and universities across the country who believe that colleges have an important role to play in democracy and who are tapping the power of the arts, humanities, and design in our work to address social justice. And I've, I've been having chills um, sitting here in the audience realizing how this play, which is trying to get us to have a more realistic history of America, relates to our organization's name, Imagining America. And so we've convened a dozen scholars um, in Maculata, Laura Benila at Hostos is one of them, to generate scholarship in collaboration with the artists um, in real time during the play creation process. Uh, one thing that another scholar in our cohort pointed out was that there's a lot of material from artists after they produce something reflecting, but there's very few you know, high quality multimedia material that's produced scholarly material in real time with the artists as they're making creative decisions. So through social media and with our guest editor, Jose Zarate, who's collaborating with us in South Korea, and with the roadside team, uh, Zhivko Ilyev, uh, our web community coordinator, and Donna Porterfield, longtime managing director for 35 years and playwright, we are attempting to create scholarship and make it public. So thanks to HowlRound launching on March 22nd, um, there will be a blog series. It will feature Maribel's essay that she's working on, an excerpt of it, and the theme is Beyond Cliché, Dramatizing Our American Identity. And then in April, we'll have several events with uh, college programs across the country as well as in this region and open to the public um, so you all can come back again. Tonight we have students from Cornell University, University of Oregon, um, Ohio State and University of Kentucky tuning in and they will come for an institute uh, with thanks to Eduardo Gonzalez from Cornell Cooperative Extension in collaboration with this, this network of organizations come in April to see the play and to learn from the artists. Thanks. Thank you, Thank you Jamie. Thank you to all of our partners. Thank you to our in-house team, Associate Artistic Directors Alvan Colon Lespier and Jorge Merced, uh, Jessica Moya, who is uh, Chief of Technology behind there. We have uh, Omar Perez, who's also helping us with this live stream. I want to uh, thank you all for being here on behalf of Pregones and to invite you to join us. I see friends in the audience, and I hope we get a chance to uh, chat a little bit more informally. And, uh, and, and, and we do hope to see you uh, again here at Pregones. As you see, no, uh, next week we have a great beatbox program here. That this Omar is the director, and March's music is fast approaching. And after March's music, we head downtown to Betsy. So we have a full spring ahead of us. And thank you for coming tonight. And thank you to our host, Arnaldo, yeah, independent yeah. scholar and longtime development officer with Pregonis and Puerto Rican Traveling Theater.